successful uh, practitioners uh, work in their varying fields uh, and approach challenges within that built environment. Uh, and the, nat the, the second aspect of it is also the nature of exchange uh, we use and of ideas. How do we exchange those ideas and translate them into spatial uh, uh, solutions? And I think um, this is uh, where these lectures become very valuable, not only to students, but also to our colleagues. Um, also, before I introduce Pierre Swanepoel from Studio Mass and Gustav uh, Prickelt, who will be sharing with him the presentation, Some House Rules, please ensure that all your uh, microphones are on mute. Uh, and I think that would just uh, simplify matters. Um, also, there is, as part of the um, CPD uh, accreditation, there are CPD registration forms available um, in the con con conversation box on the side. You can download those and submit those or fill them in and submit them uh, until uh, 12 o'clock this, this, uh, uh, today. All right. First and foremost, I would like to introduce you to uh, Pierre. And, and Gustav, um, uh, in terms of the second lecture, uh, Pierre academically qualified as an architect in 1990 at the University of Pretoria and also completed further studies in urban design uh, at Oxford Brooks in the mid 1990s. After having worked a couple of years at uh, the back then TC Design, um, he established Studio Mass, uh, which over the last two decades has, has been responsible for a variety of public uh, and commercial architectural projects and urban design projects. Um, and together with Precious uh, Markwe and Sean Mahoney, um, they have been responsible for some of our iconic buildings in, 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 an, in South Africa and, and abroad. And these four examples are the Circa Gallery, the Joburg Metro Center Chambers, uh, the Courtyards in Oxford and multiple more. Pierre and Gustav, thank you very much for agreeing to share some of your insights, and um, we're looking forward to the lecture. Thank you, Ludwig. So we're going to, it's the first Microsoft Teams and uh, presentation to so many people, so let's just see how it goes. You must just help me through this. I just want to make sure, is Gustav in? Is Gustav in the, in the, in the presentation? I, don't I, hope that I, I am here. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so thanks, Gustav. Here so, we go. So I'm going to. Um, can everybody see the screen? It says uh, Volk with a little cloud on it. Can Not, you yet. See it? Not, Not yet. yet. Not yet. Help me here. There's a red box around it, so you should see yeah, it now. Here we go. Uh, yeah, we can see it now. Hi there, colleagues uh, and students. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's really difficult because you can't see people's faces, and normally when you do these presentations, at least you know you can respond to. To if people get full, uh, become sleepy, or you can see they're not interested, you move on. So this time it's a little difficult, and uh, so bear with us. Um, um, we're going to share with you uh, a project that I did with a, a, a friend, and um, and uh, his name is Gustav. And Gustav is not an architect, but he's he's very much involved with the. Uh, um, Gustav, do you want to explain what you do? I think it's better that you do it. Let me just unmute. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Gustav Preikult. Um, and as Pia said, uh, I have no pretensions to be an architect. Uh, we uh, have built a digital studio over the last 20 years, um, uh, working commercially and building uh, very large scale digital platforms uh, commercially. Um, so these would be what you uh, in the old days used to call websites. Uh, more recently, um, we've been building artificial intelligence platforms and natural language platforms um, to reach millions of people 
um, both commercially and, and, and non-commercially. And I think more importantly, what 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 really um, what made this uh, collaboration really interesting for for our team and for for the work that we do is uh, we we also started a non-profit about a decade ago that specifically works with uh, uh, with the public sector. Um, so in other words, government. You might have seen you might have seen during this terrible time of COVID the WhatsApp lines uh, that uh, have been uh, providing information to citizens um, uh, whenever our president goes on air. Um, those uh, WhatsApp lines are backed by artificial intelligence systems that allow us to communicate with tens of millions of people at the, at the, at the same time. Uh, and those have been built by our nonprofit. So we are very uh, much uh, involved in building public infrastructure, but only but but digital public infrastructure. So um, I think this collaboration from from my team and, and our perspective was really interesting. Um, we usually avoid physical infrastructure like the plague. Um, so this is a this is a really frightening and, and interesting project for us to get involved in. Thanks. OK, so today is not pure architecture, but we do look at in this time that we're living in, we're looking at how we as 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 designers, um, urban designers and architects have impact on 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 the world around us. If we look a little bit beyond buildings and, you know, we consider as, as part of what we do, we consider the road infrastructure, the space between buildings or the, the public space, and that includes the road infrastructure as part of the world that we should be designing um, because that is the world that you and me and all the people that we work for um, interact with every day and I've seen so often that as architects and as, as, as urban planners and designers um, the outside areas or the, the let's call it the road reserve that's the space between buildings ends up being paving patterns and it becomes very decorative so for for this this project, which I'll introduce a little bit, um, sort of five slides down, is really to consider how we as designers can really start to get involved with it, and that was why it was so wonderful to work with Gustav because we not only work with engineers, landscape architects, and project managers, but I think as architects we could get involved far more in the kind of infrastructure that we're going to talk about today. So this is another example, this is big, you know, where that infrastructure tends to be very decorative. So I'm very interested to know what this trophy architect space looks like today. Um, so we, we're really concerned about how we can use that infrastructure and involve the way infrastructure is installed in our cities. So I want to take you back to Rome. Rome is the, the, the city in the world with the most fountains. And these fountains, um, for most people today, is considered decorative or a tourist attraction, like you can see here. This is the Trevi Fountain in Rome. Now, the Trevi Fountain, um, all the fountains in Rome with that beautiful clean water, was water that was taken from the mountains and brought into the city, mostly for people to consume, for animals to consume, um, for the baths in Rome, they were really part of the infrastructure. But this infrastructure became celebrated and became these kind of elements, these fountains that is still there. And they're still running and they still run with gravity. And behind all this infrastructure was, well, these fountains were huge aqueducts that brought the water into Rome to bring the fresh water into Rome. So our our cons and today it's used for many, many other things. It's not just a place that we can, I don't think there's anybody who drinks water from these fountains anymore it's because we have portable water in taps. But there's an important lesson to learn here that we could celebrate that infrastructure. So Gustav and myself submission. Well, I, I also want to add that it's, it's still used in places in small towns in Europe um, where you see uh, the use of, of fountains where people drink water. Um, in Paris, there's a project now where you where you can actually go and fill your bottles of water in the streets, um, even sparkling water, uh, in an attempt to get rid of these plastic bottles that we carry around. So, a project was announced some 18 months ago um, by the Rupert Foundation, um, which asked for a social impact they well, call it the social impact art prize. So they challenged us to, as architects and artists, so to, to, to think about 
what we would do in Grafreinet, because the Rupert Foundation have a big stake in, 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 in the town and how it develops, um, as well as the museums and, and, and uh, restaurants and farms are in the area, so they, they kind of try to give back to the community. But this was a project where they said, let's see how we can impact our communities positively through the use of arts, the arts. So they consider architecture as part of it. So Gustav and myself collaborated and were announced as one of the three winners. So the project we shared with you today is not pure architecture, but it's really to look at um, what impact art and the collaboration between various types of infrastructure can have in a town. So our project is mainly, is we're going to give you a clue, it's a, it's a data fountain. So I think, um, Gustav, you talk to the slides, essentially. Yeah, I think um, maybe as a just a quick introduction um, and and where the the naming of the project came from as well, and and just how the the, the relationships uh, kind of worked. Um, this is actually uh, the picture on the right hand side. We we were very lucky as part of this project to to go down to Crawfordnet and to spend some time with uh, the community. So the the picture on the right here is one of the the early learners in in the primary school in, in Um and uh, the, it had an interesting resonance for us. I think we we we've grown up, um, especially the last decade or two decades, with with internet being uh, almost universally available. Especially if you if you if you're lucky to 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 grow up uh, in an affluent way. Um, but the resonance here for me is really interesting. Um, the the picture on the left hand side is actually one of the children's books that I grew up with, um, and and the iconography there is where the the of the cloud that that protects and nourishes um, our society. Um, and the, the, the resonance for us here really was around, we'll talk a little bit more about that, is the importance, obviously, we think a lot about the importance of water and how, how our society depends on it. Um, but increasingly nowadays, and, and more interestingly, increasingly nowadays through, through the time of COVID, you know, we, we did this project obviously before COVID hit uh, South Africa. Um, and I think all of us uh, during lockdown have now realized how incredibly important, uh, actually life-giving data has become as important and life-giving as, as water. Our society would not have, have been able to, to work through the challenges of COVID. It would not have been able, we wouldn't have been able to do this lecture now if it hadn't been uh, for Ubiquitous for data. Um, but I think the critical thing here that, that we're thinking about is uh, that the availability of data does not become a further dividing um, line in our society. That uh, data, which is supposed to uh, enable um, collaboration and enable our society, enable education, doesn't become a, a further uh, a dividing line in our society and, 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 and increase inequities in, in our society. So um, I think throughout this presentation and throughout the work, uh, we found more and more parallels between the utility and the, and the necessity of, of water and the public infrastructure around that and uh, also data and how important that is for a society and the, and the fabric of, of uh, our society. So over to you, Pierre. Yeah, so going back to Graaf Renet, it's also one of our very ancient and historic landscapes where, um, you know, when for the people who lived in that area, um, they made sketches, they left us sketches of, of what they saw in that landscape. And, the sketches gives us an idea of what was important to them. Um, and you can see the animals and people, you know, and relationships becomes quite important and the, the awareness of self. So we kind of wondered what sort of iconography um, could be important in, in, this, in the time that we live today. And Gustav has spoken about data, but for us, and especially in a place like Graaf Renet and in the months leading up to our presentation, they were, they went through an incredible drought. And um, it was interesting for us, the, 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 the picture on the right was when we visited Graaf uh, Renet, we went up to the mountain and we saw these dew, you know, we saw the dew on the grass, but that water was not accessible. So you can see where we're starting to go with this, where we play with the idea of the Volk 
and the cloud, the cloud being the place where we store our information these days, where all of our information is stored, but also the cloud and in that small layer of atmosphere is where a lot of our moisture of this planet is, is, is kept. So a lot, a big percentage of our water is actually in the atmosphere, um, in the cloud. So it becomes interesting that, um, as Gustav says, for the communities, their data is, is a scarcity, just like water is a scarcity. So we started to play with that iconography. Um, at the time when we when we did this presentation in, in, in Stellenbosch, the final presentation, there was a big exhibition by um, Pirnia in the room next door. And uh, we included this slide, but what we did was, um, uh, Gemma here took the clouds away. And it's as if, there's a big part of that picture of that icon that was removed. So PNF have a very particular way of, of, of representing clouds. I've never really seen clouds like that, but um, it is 50% of the picture, you know? So the communities and in Africa and Southern Africa where we live, the idea of cloud, the promise of rain is an incredibly important aspect of what we did. So also at the time when we visited, um, Graaf uh, Net, this was the newspaper we picked up on the first day we were there. It was really interesting um, because there's this incredible connection between hope and clouds. You know, clouds doesn't always bring rain, but it's it brings hope. And, uh, you know, we weren't, it, it, it wasn't, we didn't have the, the threat of, of COVID at the time. But um, now looking back at it, uh, you know, even the virtual cloud now brings the type of hope that we that we so badly need now. You know, it's it's the only access we have at, to at education or um, social interaction. So these are some of the sketches we made, and um, and this basically summarizes our project. So there's an artist, there's an iconography that is the cloud, the cloud of hope, of rain and water, and at the same time the cloud that talks about where you save your your photographs, your memories these days um, in this virtual world. Because I don't know if you have got anything to say about this slide, but this is this is really the sharp end of where we started our project. Um, yeah, I think from this one, it's going to the next slide. Uh, obviously, the the we, we, we talk about physical clouds that represent water, and we talk about uh, digital clouds that represent data uh, but i think really importantly the data uh, and, and cloud infrastructure is not just about uh, accessing services it's also our connectivity so the same way that you have topography uh, and structure uh, in the physical environment uh, increasingly our lives are defined by the topography of our connections and you can see on the right hand side it's that that's actually a what we would call an influencer diagram which has been generated by one of the one of the social networks that uh, that we built. Interestingly enough, almost all the the the, the social cohesion social networks that we nowadays have uh, in the digital realm, whether it be through via WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, uh, or any other means, um, uh, you can um, determine the the connect connectedness of an individual uh, by counting the the nodes um, or the edges between every node. And then you can, and you can see in this particular diagram, the the size of the the node is proportional to the 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 weight of that node in the in the net in network. And I think really interestingly is that the, the that our other digital networks are to a great extent starting to determine the um, connectivity and the and the and the importance, and more importantly also the the spread of information within networks. So your distance between nodes can be defined by the the jumps that between any two nodes a network can be defined by how many jumps it takes to, to get to that person. And the spread of the information that is largely determined by um, the distance between those nodes and the connectedness of those nodes. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and clearly, if you don't have the ability to be connected to this network, you, you are not able to connect to the, the world of information, the world of opportunity, of jobs, of health, uh, of services that so uh, that are now becoming so important uh, in modern society. I think the next slide. Um, 
the the other interesting thing that I want to mention when you, when we when we started looking at this the the you know there's a when when Cape Town went through through its water crisis and uh, as Pierre mentioned Crawfernet went through its longest drought in a, in a thousand years uh, which only broke uh, last year um, we we all have a fairly good idea what the what the minimum amount of water is that is needed per person which is around fifty liters per day um, ironically or I think very importantly uh, uh, every human being. Uh, should really have between 50 and 100 megabytes of data per day as well. Um, and there's been a, a big outcry. South Africa has uh, extremely high data costs uh, comparatively, uh, if you think about the, the state of development of our country. Um, and there's been um, justly so uh, a, a big movement to drive down uh, access costs to the point where we, we believe that there should be um, at a minimum amount of data that every person should go get, uh, and it should be a fundamental right. The same way that getting water and uh, safety from persecution, um, data and access to digital services should be a fundamental right. And there are many services that you just cannot uh, access. Um, financial health, community, all these platforms um, that makes it possible for you to, to uh, participate in the modern economy. Uh, many of those are closed off to you if you don't have access to data. Thank you, Pierre. Okay, so the next slide, um, before we, we talk to this next slide, um, I think it's important to understand that, you know, we observed in Graafrenet in the mornings um, uh, in the pro town proper that this is the poor town, so people would move through this area, that's a taxi rank, into the historic center of Graafrenet. And we noticed that in the mornings, as people went to work um, and the small kids went to school, they would gather outside the uh, old mutual and the net bank um, branch buildings. And uh, when, we, when we looked closer and we asked them what they were doing, they said to us, well, this is where we can access free Wi-Fi because these organizations were making it available free inside their banks. And it was interesting that the crowd that gathered outside gave us the idea that, like that fountain in Rome, that if we created a place where the data was free, in a place which is public space, that we can actually use this data fountain, this data cloud of Hulk, as the place where, as a device to actually create um, public space. So our, we chose this site as our site where we were going to um, construct and erect Volk because all these people who live here were funneled through this space and then into the historic center. So now I can see where we're going with this. We view, we're using Volk as a device of free data to give people, to actually create public space uh, and where people can gather like that water fountain or the water fountains in Rome. Good stuff that that's that summarizes it. So this is pretty much where our project starts now. Um, mm -hmm. We then looked at, you know, we so the little practicality. You know, we we put these things together, but we have to consider always. You know, how how do we do a project like this when the site is not zoned? So I'm talking here, um, maybe to a lot of my colleagues as well. And this was some of the questions we had to to answer in the presentation itself is, you know, how do we know we would get the permission to build this big structure? Um, and we found that there's a piece of legislation in South Africa that allows people to put up billboards, these ugly uh, devices of commerce. And uh, essentially the idea was to take one of these and just deconstruct it and then use that as our device for bulk because there was a legislation that will allow us then to erect that in that space. Um, we also were, you know, you, you're in a kind of a desert environment, so anything that grows and casts a shadow is very important. So if you go back to that slide, um, there's a row of trees here and you could see how people would percolate through the town. And then there was a pathway where they were looking for shade. You know, we're in the middle of the winter now, but in summer and in time when we visited, there was really, really hot. So you were always looking out for a piece of shade. So it was important that this device and setting up our own brief is also a place of shade. Um, because 
in Africa, we don't use umbrellas necessarily for rain. You know, we mostly use it to create a, a, a small piece of, of shade that we can move in. Um, so this is the space. So you can see the historic center of Graf Renet and, and the poor or the black community up there and, and then all the movement through um, this space. So we thought that this walk would set up an opportunity not just for people to gather and meet and share ideas, but later to share commerce. Um, so the square could be flanked by commercial and and the black building here is the taxi rank and that gray little building was the um, the daycare center. So it started to make sense that this is a catalytic project to set up a public space that currently doesn't exist and then sort of bridge this gap between the poor and the rich and the new city and the historic city. So how do we how do we make this? You know, cloud in its essence, if you if you if you lie next if you lay a line of grass and you look at clouds, and we've all done that when we were kids, essentially a very amorph shape. You know, so it's not a it's not necessarily um, something that has a particular shape, but there is an iconography that's attached to it, and uh, the digital world has hijacked the cloud, and they gave us some shape and form that we can work to. So we took this idea of a very spiky almost dandelion idea and we, we said look that would form the backbone or the, sh the, the shape of our, of our cloud. Furthermore, um, we want this cloud to give us that bit of rain. So we talked to you about the condensation that we saw up in the mountains and uh, in winter or if you've seen if you've ever seen a, a corrugated sheeting roof um, as architects we put a, a damp layer underneath it because we get condensation on these on, on these on these roofs so this is a desert beetle this beetle comes out at night early in the morning and then because of the heat differentiation there's condensation on its body and that's how it actually survives in the desert so we made our own desert beetle if you wish call it the desert flower it was a uh, it was a piece of aluminium um, that was black on the inside, where we lose a lot of heat, and it was had the plastic layers. It's a Luca bond for any of the architects who have used it before, and then a silver layer on the outside. We took one of these things and we took it to Graf Renet when we were there, and what you find is that we get the condensation. It happens early in the morning because the black um, radiates a lot of heat out. So there's a it's the the, the metal, the, the material is colder in the surrounding environment, and that causes any moisture in the air to condensate on it. We put a lot of this together, and that formed basically the, um, the, the material for our cloud. So this would be woven together. Um, there's a model at the end. We can show you what it looked like. Gustav, I don't know if this animation will work on this platform. Um, uh, no, it, no, it's a PDF, it won't play now. Yeah. So this then drooped over the dandelion type form to give us our, our, our cloud. So this cloud was that little girl you saw in the first picture. It was her sketch that we adapted um, to make this element. So we think it should be really, really shiny. Shininess helps us then with the condensation processes. And then on the bottom of the cloud, there was this cable. So if you were to go onto the public square where there's the data and you would pull on these ropes or chains, then hopefully some of that condensation will fall on the environment below it. So here's a picture of the cloud of the model we built in the office um, in miniature. Um, because of COVID, we haven't had a chance to to develop it further. Um, um, we're waiting to see how this comes together, but the idea is to then construct this, we were asked to put a budget in with our submission and we would build it. So there you can see one of our tablets, our due tablets, um, this exhibition. So there you can see what it would look like. Um, this was just the exhibition that formed part of our presentation. Uh, and then, uh, Gustav, if you want to talk about its barrel. Yeah, I think, and I think one, one thing Pierre mentioned is the, the, the idea that um, Obviously, physical infrastructure is visible to the in the environment and 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 to people walking through that square. Um, but the problem with digital infrastructure and these 
and these data hotspots is that quite often people don't know where they are, so they have to discover them. And, and one of the really powerful ideas is that by manifesting this bulk as a, as a physical structure, it's something that could be replicated. Um, and we thought, you know, one of the interesting things is a billboard is always some very particular commercial idea, but the Volk uh, would be something that's neutral, that'd be recognizable as a, as, as a data fountain to, to, um, to citizens, um, and it would be freely available up to a cap. And one of the ideas would be that as you walk up to the Volk, you could ask it a question, and through using, um, I think really importantly also, by being relevant locally, providing information that is physically linked to that specific environment. One of the biggest challenges we have with global services um, like WhatsApp and Facebook, et cetera, that they're not sufficiently localized. And so that, for instance, job opportunities, uh, learnership opportunities, um, health facilities, information that's particularly relevant to users in that physical environment are often not localized enough. And so one of the ideas here would be that because we know that where the node is physically uh, in that square, um, if you walk up to the device, you could say, hi, Volk, and you can ask questions in your local language. And so you could speak in Corsa or in Afrikaans or in English, and uh, the system would chat back to you via WhatsApp or any other chat platform. And we would be, be able to, uh, to harness uh, all the local information by working with the municipality, by working with local government, uh, and by working uh, to create local job opportunities. So the idea would be that because we have the physical infrastructure that we can um, project our free Wi-Fi through, uh, it would become a node um, and also a meeting place for people. So that you, this, the, 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 the physical manifestation makes it possible for you to know what you can connect to. And you can see there on the screenshot, shot, uh, we just built a, a small prototype one of the interesting ideas here as well was to connect temperature sensors, cameras, and to also create a visual record and a temperature record of the environment um, that would be accessible. Um, and also, uh, not only would we be providing a bridge for citizens to the world, but also for the world to connect back into uh, Net. So in other words, finding opportunities for tourism, uh, finding opportunities for um, uh, for people from around the world to be able to access hyperlocal information. One of the ideas of, of bulk, apart from data, would also be storage. One of the, the really crazy things at the moment, when one of our interviews, we're chatting to somebody who said, all my memories are pictures that I'm taking on my mobile phone. If I run out of, if I run out of space on my mobile phone, I run out of memories. I need to start deleting old pictures. One of the ideas here, would, apart from data, would also to provide cloud storage for any citizen uh, who, who lives in the community. And so not only are we connecting citizens to each other, we're also providing them with free storage. And I think that really pulls us all together in, in terms of the idea of uh, social. I mean, the, the really interesting question is what, what is a social impact art prize? And for us, I think we, we solidly came down on the, on the question of what is the impact of this project? How, how would we be able to measure, have people's lives actually improved because this device and this project um, came about uh, in this community. And, and I think uh, making this a, a physical manifestation um, and providing connectivity and services that we can measure we see improvement in people's lives would deliver against that uh, social impact. Yeah, so in conclusion, I think uh, as, as architects, we're going to go through and into a very, very difficult period of time um, where, you know, just the need for space and the type of space we need is going to be a real, real challenge. And I think for me, this was an interesting collaboration with Gustav to talk about how, and, and we, we really did this before COVID, but it's sort of maybe brought it home, just what we've been going through in the last few months is space and space and connectivity and, and opportunities that that could create um, public spaces. Um, so I think that uh, like that fountain in Rome, um, there's not lots of water that we can squirt around in, in Graf Renet, but we can share connectivity through data and through that create an art prize that has got some meaning to the people around it. Um, so that was really our presentation. Uh, uh, lots of people that helped us bring it to life 
Um, and uh, but something that was really enjoyable and it's something different. It's not architecture. So I hope you guys um, had value out of this presentation. But I think it is something that we're going to have to face up to as architects and planners and designers um, and looking at how we collaborate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustav. Um, I don't know if there's any other slide. This is the last slide, uh, Ludwig. So we hand it back to you. Yes, uh, you. Gustav and Pierre, thank you very much for that presentation. I think it's been very insightful. Um, and I think that is exactly the um, discourse that we do need to have about everywhere exchange or everywhere learning and also lifelong learning uh, rather than always being uh, in these very traditional formats, um, uh, even in teaching at the university level. Also, I think um, I'm also going to try and uh, open it up for some discussion around this. I must admit, uh, we didn't expect 280 people, uh, which is quite, um, could be unruly, uh, to say the least. Um, so I would attempt for some question if someone might want to raise their hands. Also, I want to beg your pardon for not allowing or making available comments on the comments sections. I think that's something that we've also learned and will learn in our way forward so people can comment whilst the speakers talk. Um, so I think from that perspective, I'm going to allow us, um, some hands for some queries. Enrico? Uh, thanks for the lecture. Um, I just wanted to go back to your material response that uh, that deals with condensation. Um, I just want to know how you guys did the research around knowing what materials you needed to to select for for crafting it. Um, you know, our project started with um, uh, a condensation net. And that is uh, something that's used in the mountains um, and as a project by the South African government. So they, found, they call it a dew, what do you call it, a, a, a condensation fog net, hmm? fog nets, yes. And these fog nets are, are strung up and as the wind blows through it and uh, the humidity, relative humidity is high enough, you'd find condensation that happens on it, like on, on, on vegetation, you, we've all seen it. But we realized quickly that in the mountains surrounding Crawford, that would work. But in the town itself, down at the in the in the in the, in the bowl of Crawford, that wasn't possible. So we basically researched it. We went on condensation um, on the internet, and we found that there's uh, there's a group of people in India um, working with the French government that looks at condensation and harvesting the condensation that really happens on metal roofs. So I invite you to. I don't want to go into the technicalities necessary, but you can go you can go onto Google, and um, and you can also just explore your your technical documents in architecture. You know, if you don't put a vapor barrier underneath your corrugated sheeting roof, you'd find that because of the the material being colder than its environment, that condensation happens on a sheeting and then drips down into the gutter. So you sometimes see water coming out. The, the, the material was really to create a differentiation. So you really need the, the temperature of the material to cool down more than its surrounding environment for allow to condensate. So the black material um, was, was the obvious choice. So we've learned a lot from, from that organization. We're happy to post that. Um, but there's a there's a whole there's an organization, Gemma, called the Condensation Commission. Commission of the World or something. It was something in India and they and they they're using it as a as a way to harvest um, moisture from the air. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? believe 280 guests and no questions um good morning hello Nambi. um thank you pierre thank you gustav um you've given um a very rich lecture and thank you ludwig for putting this together uh my first 
reaction when I saw the attendance was, oh my gracious goodness, um, we are adapting and we are um, learning new ways of being in a new community. And here you are come observations that this digital technology and adaptation you hope should not become more and more separate separation lines is uh, poignant but there are you you both raised to so many issues that are just rich and perhaps i missed some of them uh, i'll just raise two questions to one question to each one of you it's almost the same question here how has this collaboration changed your understanding of architecture and gustav um you may you began with some um um shall i say um declarations about uh, just being an artist but i didn't think that you are an architect that an architect is somebody who makes something that's a broad definition so based on that i'm asking you the same question i asked pierre how has this collaboration changed your understanding of art uh, uh, there is so many more questions, but I'd like to stop there and thank you both. I'll, I'll start. I'll start with the how's it changed my view of architecture. So I think you have to understand um, what we do at Studio Mass as well is that our buildings influence the city, and our city is influenced by the way we do our buildings. So that that was already a point of departure that we have in the practice in the way that we work. But what I what I've really changed is that when I look at a cell phone tower now, I don't, you know, I see a piece of infrastructure, but I'm asking myself, why can't it be something that we celebrate as part of the fabric of our city? And if I see a water tower, I think to myself, but that should be celebrated as part of the infrastructure of a, a public space. Um, because these, there's a scarcity about resources as, as, as our cities grow, you know, with many more people needing water, and I'm starting to think to myself if data is going to be, a, it's going to have to be a, a human right one of these days in a way that the, this pandemic has changed the way we do things. But at, as, a, as, as a piece of architecture or as a piece of built environment, I just think that there's a, there's a real chance for us to get more involved with our infrastructure, our cell phone towers, our water towers, um, our roads, and start to celebrate it as as part of our lives and not just something that we need um, um, that's accidental to our living in the cities. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and, and uh, Nandi, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I think from, from our perspective, we, we're very used to building uh, infrastructure, data infrastructure that can reach on an aggregate uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of users. Um, but I think what, what's really interesting about this project and thinking about how um, the physical environment enables um, connectivity, it, it, it brought something home to me, which, which, which I think has now been accelerated during the time of COVID. Is if, it, by the way, a lot of the work we're doing with COVID right now is about stopping the spread of a disease. And the, and, and, and the epidemiological models we're using, the CR models um, that you probably guys have looked at, depend to a great extent on, on physical um, connectivity. When, in other words, do, do I make physical connection with somebody? And so we, we have a lot of data modeling techniques to look at networks and to see how information can spread in networks. Um, but the, the models are almost exactly the same and the, the mathematical principles are almost exactly, exactly the same to, to model the spread of disease in physical communities. And again, uh, the topology of the physical environment uh, is um, absolutely fundamental in, in, in trying to understand the, the spread of disease, but also the spread of information. And I, and I think uh, what's been really interesting to me is to think about uh, if we look at a country like South Africa or Africa more in general, if we're building services and especially universal services like health services in time of COVID, it's not good enough just to reach 80% or 70% of users. So in South Africa right now, um, we have 100% coverage in mobile phones and 70% uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, smartphones. But we don't have 100% coverage in data yet in South Africa. And so the challenge is, 
And and the only way to overcome that, and like the the most vulnerable people in in our in our country and in Africa and in the world, are also least likely to have access to data. And and I, I think without understanding the physical uh, relationship of a person to where you know the the ability of of getting free data or, or accessing those data services, we will not bridge that last gap. We won't get to the most vulnerable, the last five percent or the last ten percent, what we call the long tail. Um, in, in, in in digital data services. And so if we want to de develop uh, universal health services, if we want to overcome uh, COVID-19 and, and the next pandemic that's that's going to to hit us in the next, you know, next decade, uh, we will have to understand and acknowledge that physical infrastructure uh, will be will be a, a key part of, of, of bridging that last mile to, to the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you to both of you. I believe there was a hand up, Ludwig. Yeah. I yield. Thank you. This is Rich. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. It's a really fascinating uh, project. Uh, also, uh, an incredible initiative. I think uh, well done to everyone that actually been involved. Uh, my question follow from the, the one that uh, was posed uh, previously, but more on the uh, issues related to the collaboration with the community, just thinking how what the techniques and methodologies that you have used to make sure that the, the community had a, a role in shaping uh, the ideas and also the the, the outcome of, of this um, uh, initiative. I mean, um, you're using very sophisticated technology, uh, also um, fantastic collaboration with uh, many different uh, skills, artists, uh, botanists, people that actually understand uh, the environmental conditions, and obviously the uh, the architectural and uh, planning uh, profession. Therefore, I think you've got a incredible ingredients going in this particular uh, process that are really will be fascinating to learn from and link it to the community how we engage them more uh, directly into um, the outcome of, of, of this process. Thank you very much. Monica, there's, I, I guess there's two questions in that as well. So the one Gustav can answer in terms of what he's been doing with Hello Mum. Or, or, um, but from, a, from an architectural perspective, um, this project has, I would imagine, I think it's three parts of it, really. The first part was when we, uh, all the, there was finalists, I think there was a number of finalists that was cho chosen and we were all taken to Graaf Renet for about a week. So we had the chance to, to, to temper our initial proposals with and talking to the community. And obviously, uh, seeing how people also move through the town. So we had some engagement and uh, we went to the schools as well to talk to them about access to data and they drew the vault for us as a cloud um, that we could then take to shape. Uh, but the third part of our presentation that, what, that we didn't emphasize on but is importantly um, going back to the community and uh, you know the, in the way that the, the vault is assembled we would obviously engage uh, the local people to help us and to make in the making of the of the, of the vault. Um, importantly, Gustav, maybe you want to talk about the services that we then offer inside the vault um, and below it. So there is money, um, Monica, that is set aside. So the council in, in that area have themselves identified a number of projects, um, as you as you know, through the through the regional development frameworks and developing that square some money was set aside to develop it further. So we are latching on to that processes that they've gone through with their communities and then with art, um, this shiny object on that space as well. Um, but the last part of our project would still, we have to go back to Graaf Renet and take it further. So we have a plan of doing that. Um, we just couldn't have done it. It should have been ongoing now, but because of COVID that was stopped. Gustav? Yeah, and uh, just in terms of the skills, obviously, from the, I think what makes this uh, complex, uh, apart from the physical environment, 
and planning and dealing with municipality. Obviously, we have all the relationships that we need to uh, foster and develop with um, uh, network infrastructure. So uh, that that tower needs either line of sight or uh, fiber connectivity. Um, we don't want to create the second rate experience. One of my bugbears is this idea that uh, that we should be creating a two tiered internet or like a poor internet for poor people. Um, I think uh, the, the whole point is to, to have high quality, uh, high bandwidth internet uh, to allow people uh, to play and to explore and to watch videos. Um, and so there's a big amount of effort that that's gone into making sure that we can we can deliver that for that uh, entire community. Um, and then uh, to the services, uh, we've identified, I think a key component that still has to come is to um, interact with and, and, and get feedback from the community. We, we had uh, some initial, we, we only had a week, uh, uh, I think early in, in, in March uh, in February actually to connect with the community and get some feedback. But what we want to do is uh, go back to the community and see what services they would like to have, how, um, and, and, and a very important point is uh, that we didn't really touch on is, uh, I know this looks like a piece of infrastructure that's being built and then we switch it on and we walk away. Um, actually, uh, what makes these things work is to have long-term involvement by the community. So there's a plan um, in place to train um, young uh, women to be, uh, to because there's a web platform that has to be designed and built, uh, the community will co uh, co-create uh, that platform uh, with the engineering team. Part of that is also to train up uh, software developers to be able to manage that. Um, I'm a firm believer in local creation, and and I'm going to say local creation, not just the content, but the actual services and 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 the digital services. Uh, one of the big problems we have in in local communities is that we are sucking the life out of them by pulling everything just into the large cities. So one of the things we want to see is whether we can't foster uh, more collaboration and enable, um, for instance, local uh, engineering and, and local software developers to be able to build the application to serve their, their own community. So there's a big project uh, around enabling uh, the community. And then the final point, and the, really the large dream here, is that the local community actually owns and manages their own local network. Um, and so that they control the connectivity between themselves and they're not necessarily dependent on a Vodacom or MTN or a large corporate in order to com communicate with uh, with their with their uh, loved ones and with other people that they that they want to communicate with. Thank you very Thanks, much. Very exciting. Um, I'm up at two further questions. One from Nicola and from Heather Dot. Let's start with Nicola. Um, morning. Thank you for the lecture, Pierre and Gustave. Um, my question actually is um, mainly directed to you, Gustav. I was quite surprised to see you on this lecture purely because um, I know you from my sister, Natalie, who works at Precult, and I never expected uh -huh. to see someone who works um, in service design in the architectural realm. So that kind of brings me to my question of, do you see a strong future for the collaboration between service design and architecture? And if so, how and where do you see it being fit? Great question. Um, uh, and, and really nice to, to uh, hear that you are Natalie's sister. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I found myself also surprised by working with architects. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think the, the future, I think the, the, the really interesting thing for me, and, and this goes back to uh, uh, and these question as well earlier is what we learned out of this. And I think the, the urban planning component of it, the physical aspects of and the physical manifestation of how networks work and the importance of taking that into consideration has been super interesting. I mean, obviously, as part of a service designer's job and a, an engineer's job, a software engineer's job is to understand all the aspects of, a, of human computer interaction and human computer action. Obviously, what do they say? The 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 fault lies between, uh, you know, the, the, the physical environment obviously has an impact on how people uh, interact with computers. But but as software engineers, we can often forget that. It's very easy just to think about advertising and Facebook and WhatsApp and, and completely ignore the, the physical components. And I think that this, this is a super exciting uh, exercise. I would love to, I think going forward, where I think the real opportunity lies is, Pierre and I have been chatting a lot lately about um, 
how cities are designed, right? I mean, I think to a large extent, you know, we could say when we build, build software, we don't consider physical infrastructure enough. But that, that point Pierre was making, when you're building cities, are, are we considering data infrastructure? I don't think we are. We're not thinking enough about that. Like the idea of thinking about where will people congregate, how will they access data, how will the how will the the data network and the connectivity uh, network um, be empowered or enabled by physical infrastructure? I think that's something that we definitely can do more about. And I think especially in in South Africa and Africa, we can lead the way there. Um, I think one of the big challenges is going to be how we deal with, uh, well, from a, from a data and service design perspective, I worry about how do we get services to uh, people in slums when we don't have enough uh, uh, infrastructure. I'm talking about data infrastructure now. Uh, but I think by the same token, we have a big job ahead of us uh, to, to, to do this with physical infrastructure. And, 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 and taking both of those into account will be super critical in, in building out uh, our cities of the future. So I think there's a, I, I'd love to see more work um, in, in Freikult.com uh, uh, in our for-profit uh, and the work that we do with carriers and with, with our commercial partners to, to incorporate urban planning and architecture as an as a input into the, the design of these large-scale systems. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Yeah, I think the reason why this question, question appear on the, uh, on the poster is Pierre's fault. So, you know, talk to Pierre. Um, Hi, can you can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, two 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 parts. Um, Pierre, you asked um, in the beginning of your talk what is what has happened to that space that big designed in in Copenhagen, um, and you referred to it as being decorative, and I completely agree. So I went there uh, two years ago, and uh, there was absolutely nothing there it had been completely kind of eroded and demolished and i think they were thinking mm -hmm. about redoing it but really not a great uh, urban place um but i wanted to talk to you about something else and um i um and that's about uh, data and data as a generator and um i was um privileged to judge at at uh, world architecture festival last year in a very interesting category which was about um infrastructure and um, one of the projects was a, um, a data center in Helsinki. And what was very interesting about it was that data centers are, exist as big boxes and you don't actually know where they are, but they're usually like hidden away. Um, and in this case, they put it right in the center of Helsinki. And what was interesting about that was that why they had done that is because a data center is not only a data center, it actually generates other things. And the one thing that it generates is heat. And so in this case, the, generate, the, the, data, the data center actually became a uh, district um, heat, water heating um, center. So in fact, the data center became a power, a power source. And um, that's so interesting for me as, as the fact that we need to start thinking about um, about infrastructure as generators in our city. So when we actually are talking about Amazon or um, there's a, a few data centers that they're talking about putting in Cape Town right now, why and where and how are we putting them and what are they going to be? Are they just going to be um, kind of suburban um, or peri-urban kind of um, industrial boxes or can they be something else? Because once you build that box, it could be something else. It could generate heat for water. It could actually be a sports center on the roof. It could be all of these kinds of things. I've, I've um, explored this idea on, on my blog, on my website, um, and I certainly want to try and push this idea um, forward. So it's interesting that you guys are, are doing the same. So that was my comment. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, what's really important is after we've done this project, um, I think lots of lot of people, a lot of architects at least, very knows Coromandel very well, where the um, where the manor house is. You know, a lot of us have visited that building for the architecture. But Sydney Press's daughter has lately become interested in preserving that building and getting and getting more involved with the community there. And she asked uh, me, "What do I think we can do?" And this was in that period during COVID between March and April. And as you know, the schools are locked. 
because um, our government can't provide online learning, e-learning to the most of the people. And the, I said to her, I think that there's a desperate need for the people in that small farmers community to have access to data. And uh, she's put up the, the, the data uh, device next to the sport fields. And I, I wish I had photographs, but what happens is the school kids would then come to that space. So to download their tasks, their assignments, and get some information from, from uh, learning. So one can imagine, just uh, to touch on, on Gustav's previous comment about how these things would collate, you know, and, and one can imagine that you can just put up one big sheltered space with fantastic data and now in a situation where we have any in the future that children or adults would be able to go to a space that is got a great microclimate where they can actually download and access information because they can't afford it themselves so um i do think if you start it's it's early but if you start thinking about it the collaboration between these two and how they come together just like water and buildings water in a city or gas or electricity all these things coming together can can really change the way we look at cities in africa where resources are incredibly incredibly um, um difficult to get and expensive these days i mean look at what's happening to escom so i think it's this is not just a lesson in data and architecture but it's a all the resources we use, um, like you have said, and architecture. Right. Um, I'm a stickler for timing, so I think we've just concluded an hour. Um, and I first of all want to thank uh, Gustav and Pierre again for their uh, fantastic input and also the, the rich conversation that followed. Um, Yes, yeah, so I think thank you from the school and also I think the students and everyone involved for, for that lively discussion. Um, maybe also just in conclusion, we are, we are recording these and I think uh, we are working towards maybe making them more broadly available. And I also want to remind um, our guests who are chasing C, uh, CPD points that in the uh, conversation uh, the segment or the chat section, there is a download available for those to register their attendance. The next uh, session is, um, I think, next week, Monday, uh, and uh, it's also at 10 o'clock. Uh, let me just double check before I say there's something wrong. It's the Dant Maharaj, and uh, we expect um, also quite a lively discussion around that. Again, as a last comment, thank you very much to everyone, and we hope to see you soon again. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.